Order, order. The motion before this House is that this House believes we are too focused on science, technology, engineering and maths. Education. My name is Neil Carberry. I'm your speaker for this afternoon. Uh, I am both a representative of the British Business Organization, the CBI, and the holder of a degree in the ancient languages, which I think is as close as you can come to impartial in, the, in this debate. Um, in a moment, I'll ask our first uh, speaker to speak and to propose the motion. Then I'll ask our first opposition speaker. We'll have two further speakers for each side. There'll be some time for questions and debate. And I will come to the floor during this, so have your questions ready. You can get involved either on the app or commenting on Twitter with the hashtag, hashtag GESF. We're going to start, however, by taking a test of your initial feeling on the motion. So we are going to go to a first vote. Some instructions on the screen for you there. It will be vote one to support the motion, vote two to reject the motion, You'll have 10 seconds, and your last vote will count. One vote per pad, and it is the last one that counts. So vote now. Good. Of course, we're not going to tell you the answer until later. Because we want, th th this is, uh, we're, we're testing progress, not original, uh, 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 not, uh, not original achievement. A few ground rules before we start. This is the motion. Please stick to it for both sides. And stick to time. I will step in. I am an interventionist chair. So that's seven minutes for each uh, speaker to open and three minutes for one speaker from each time to close. And one other thing. This House wants to hear about all our children, technicians as well as PhDs. We want to hear about Edinburgh and Edmonton and Entebbe. And play nice, because after all, this is a, this is a house of uh, great repute. So I am going to ask to move the motion Anna Winthrop, who is from the Department of Music and Performing Art Professions at New York University. Anna. Thank you so much, Speaker. Thank you, and thank you for coming. This is a very interesting topic for me because I believe that science and technology and engineering and mathematics are of ultimate importance. However, there's a hierarchy that exists in education worldwide, and within this hierarchy, STEM is somewhere at the top, and the humanities are below STEM, and the arts are invariably at the very bottom. And this is hugely problematic because quality arts education not only develops skills that are crucial to applying STEM knowledge, but it is one of the most powerful tools we have to help students succeed in school and beyond. In fact, all of the evidence shows that focusing solely on STEM at the expense of a broader curriculum that supports arts training and integrated learning is not only detrimental to students, but it's also inefficient. We know that teaching through the arts, which is when the arts are used as a medium to teach concepts in academic classes, helps students learn on a deeper level, retain information longer, and is highly effective at reaching different types of learners. We also know that teaching in the arts or arts training has a tremendous impact on overall brain health and creative capacity. Neuroscience shows us that engaging in an artistic act such as playing an instrument while reading and interpreting the music utilizes more parts of the brain simultaneously than any other type of human activity. And this whole brain function leads to faster and broader thinking. It's the hallmark of highly creative individuals and it can be developed through consistent practice. In addition, the arts provide a framework of learning in which tasks and problems never have just one solution like on a standardized test, <laughs> not to talk about that. Anyone in the private sector knows that with an unknown future, we need workers 
who can think outside the box, who can look at a problem from different angles, come up with multiple solutions. You know, the arts also ask students to generate content from their own imagination, to envision something that has not yet been created. And we all know that we need people who can innovate. And this is particularly important when it comes to technology and engineering and science. Now, in addition to cognitive benefits, the arts provide social, emotional, and physical benefits that greatly impact students' behavior and their ability to function well, both in their schools and within their communities. The arts, and I should clarify, I'm talking about the visual arts, the performing arts, the literary arts. The arts expose students to people and ideas and music and paintings and cultural traditions and values that are far removed from their personal experience. And good arts training then asks students to explore these things replacing their initial judgment with observation and curiosity. And as a result, an extensive international research study commissioned by UNESCO, as well as many individual, individual studies, show that students with arts training develop higher levels of tolerance, and empathy, respect, appreciation, qualities that are invaluable to our societies. Now, we also know that engaging in the arts reduces stress levels and increases students' overall sense of well-being. It promotes fine motor skills and physical health, and in a group context, it develops leadership skills and collaboration skills, communication skills, and it creates a much-needed sense of community and connection. UCLA professor James Catterall and his colleagues followed 25,000 high school students from different types of schools in the US and found that students involved in the arts had a more positive attitude towards school, had fewer behavioral problems, they were more engaged in their academic classes, they had better friendships, they had increased attendance and graduation rates, they were much more likely to both attend and graduate college, to volunteer, to vote, and to maintain active employments as adults. Now, the most important aspect of the study to me is that it these statistics showed the greatest impact for students coming from underprivileged backgrounds. In fact, many people have looked at the research, all of the research available from the developed and the developing world, and concluded that the arts are one of the most powerful tools we have to narrow the achievement gap for marginalized and at-risk youth. And the arts do something else that is vital for underprivileged students. They create a safe space within the schools to discuss issues, a learning environment where their thoughts and their emotions are given a place of value, where they have a voice and a sense of purpose. And this can be transformative for students who are struggling. But it is these students who are in the greatest need of all of the benefits the arts provide that have the least, if any, access to arts education, which is why we need to include the arts within the schools. We need to focus on consistency and quality and teacher training and make them accessible to all children. And by the way, the research also shows us that financially the return investment on arts programs for marginalized youth can be huge. So if we can reach all children, including marginalized and at-risk youth, and help them succeed in school, everyone wins, especially STEM, which is struggling to fill the demands of the workforce. Bottom line, we need STEM graduates who can innovate with excellent interpersonal skills, critical thinking skills, research skills, and the ability to apply knowledge in real-world contexts. We also need to be careful that in our rush to focus solely on STEM, that we don't overlook the powerful and unique benefits the arts provide. In other words, for the best outcomes overall. We need to take a more holistic approach to education, one that values the arts, the humanities, and STEM equally. Winding so. up now. Sorry. Winding up now. One Winding up. Okay. okay, winding up.
So this isn't about STEM versus the arts or STEM versus the humanities. It's about STEM and the arts, STEM and the humanities. So with that in mind, I urge you to vote for the motion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. I'll invite Stephen Ritz, who's the chief executive of the Green Box Machine, to answer speaking against the motion. It is with a great tip of my hat that I acknowledge Nancy, who inspires me to bring us together on both sides of this coin, and also to this, my colleague from NYU, a college that routinely comes to study my very program in the Bronx. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, I am here to argue in a very passionate way cheese hat off my head that we could never have too much STEM, but wish to come at you in a compassionate level, integrating the arts into STEM, making it STEAM. So we are here today at the Global Education and Skills Forum. The very focus, education, equity, and most importantly for children of tomorrow, employment. Yesterday, Fareed Zakaria argued and proved so eloquently that via communication, via the art of communication, that we must upgrade our skills to meet the demands of technology. There is a new set of challenges in this world that are evolving daily. Time is no longer relevant. We can break it down to millisecond, and with the touch of a button, have access to generations and centuries of information. The problems of the new age are unprecedented, and now more than ever, no skills means no job. Cheap and untrained labor will fall by the wayside in ways that we've never imagined. In our parents' generation, hard work could get you a job somewhere. But without skills now, there will be no jobs. Arne Duncan spoke eloquently yesterday talking about a chance, expand and transforming that every single person around the globe has a stake in enhancing the quality of STEM education. And I argue for STEM education inclusive of my dear colleagues, inclusive of the arts. The US Department of Labor states that there is a 17% annual increase in STEM-related jobs. Jobs, employment, equity, and education for all. Space and time, as I said, have no constraints anymore. And Kareem Ablali yesterday here from KHDA cited an MIT survey where a four-year-old asks 100 questions a day and a 10-year-old only asks 10. Every year, with every advent of technology, we add days to our lives. But STEM enables us to add life to our days. And it is quality of life that we must be about. So for me, STEM is courage. It's giving. It's resilience. It's compassion. It's empathy. And I argue for more STEM education rooted in STEM, empathy, compassion, and the engagement of the arts and the humanities, that we can come together so that we can, together we can all prosper. In a rapidly changing world, here we are in the desert, but yet this very ecosystem is a rainforest of connectivity, expanding populations, diminished resources, urbanization and climate change. Technology will not save the world, people will. And what it means is there is a convergence of humanity, technology and sustainability that results in collisions. We're bouncing into each other every day. Connections, hopefully we will connect. And co-learning that results in new logos, pathos and ethos to make epic happen, save the world. This is STEM and this is what I argue for more of. STEM enables each and every one of us to dare and defeat the impossible daily, to go to the moon, to get on a plane, to save our world, to feed humanity. We are no longer geeks in lab coats. We're cool teachers in hats and bow ties. We are people who come to work every day passionate about what we do, children who are tinkering and making and trying to reinvent the world. We are makers. I virtue to say we are solutionaries rooted in STEM. Every field, every discipline, every content area Every well-being of our existence and our very infrastructure is wholly dependent on STEM. So not only are we able to move forward with STEM, I say we argue for more of it and embrace the notion of STEAM, as we say in the South Bronx, art, advocacy, and aspiration to worlds and lives that we've never imagined before. Education is the means to a socialized and civilized life. And as we redefine society, we must seek that common ground. 
that common ground is empirical and it is rooted in science. It is what brings us here and sets us forth outward into the world. I stand before you here as a literacy teacher, mind you, arguing for STEM with no science background at all. Yet my love of art and my love of innovation has compelled me forward to be a finalist, to tinker ourselves into a new life. And again, that a teacher from the poorest congressional district in America, an urban desert, if you will, can come to the sands and miracles of Dubai, rooted in passion, purpose, and hope, speaks to looking to moving my children forward into the world of STEAM, to combat poverty, to combat dis-ease, dysfunction, and depravity, and spread a sphere of success and opportunity they've never imagined. STEM moves every sector of society forward from striving to thriving. STEM is the power of si se puede. Yes, we can. Not no, we can't, but yes, we can. As I say, we are Americans, Mexicans, Dominicans, and in my neighborhood, inclusive Africans. And STEM is our moment. That one man in a simple cheese hat can grow 35,000 pounds of vegetables in the heart of the South Bronx using 90% less water and 90% less space regardless of seasonality, speaks to the inclusive model that the speaker asked us to embrace. We must build value for all. Excellent punctuality as well, I have Thank to you. say. Thank <laughs> you. Well, you need something special to, uh, to follow that tour de force, and I'm glad to say that we have it. So I'm, it's Indeed my privilege to uh, uh, introduce Nancy Atwell, who is the winner of last year's Global Teacher Pro uh, Prize and head at the Centre for Teaching and Learning. Nancy, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I will not be rebutting Stephen Ritz. Uh, there is no rebuttal. He's a force of nature. I adore him, and don't you wish your children were in his class? Thank you. Um, Isaiah Berlin's famous essay about Tolstoy, The Hedgehog and the Fox, takes its title from a verse by the Greek poet Archilochus. The fox knows many things, but the hedgehog knows one big thing. For Berlin, this defines a fundamental difference in how people think. Some of us are fascinated by the infinite variety of things in the world. Um, these are the foxes. While others relate everything to a central, all-embracing idea, ergo hedgehogs. As we look to the future, it's clear that people will need to be more fox-like than ever knowledgeable across disciplines, creative, flexible, strong writers, sharp readers. While science, math, and technology certainly do matter a lot, they don't matter the most. Emphasizing STEM at the expense of the humanities is a hedgehog perspective, and it's a risky one. It narrows students' worldview and their career options by shrinking the curriculum and the potential for foxy thinking and innovation. For years now, business leaders like Edgar Bronfman and Jeff Bezos have been saying that the skills acquired in a liberal, liberal arts education are exactly the ones they're looking for. Uh, Norman Augustine, who was CEO of Lockheed Martin, wrote in the Wall Street Journal, one cannot live by equations alone. The needs increasing for workers with foreign language skills and an expanded knowledge of economics, history, geography. Who wants a technology-driven economy if those who drive it aren't grounded in ethics. Augustine was in charge of 80,000 engineers. He concluded, the factor that most distinguished those who advanced in my organization was their ability to think broadly and write and read clearly. When Steve Jobs unveiled a new edition of the iPad, he said, it's an Apple's DNA that technology alone is not enough, that it's technology married with liberal arts, married with the humanities, that yields us the results that make our hearts sing. So who doesn't want students' hearts to sing, um, to have their curiosity piqued, to be inspired? It turns out a lot of politicians do not. Trashing the humanities has become a popular pastime. President Obama dissed art history majors. Former UK Education Secretary Charles Clark declared medieval history ornamental and a waste of public money. The governor of Florida said his state doesn't need any more anthropologists. Kentucky's governor proposed denying state funding to students majoring in the humanities. He said, hey, people who want to study French literature, they can do that. 
they're just not going to be subsidized by the taxpayers like engineers are. Um, and the governor of Wisconsin actually tried to revise his state university's mission from search for truth and improve the human condition to meet the state's workforce needs. Public education was never intended as vocational training. If there is a STEM crisis, and Robert Charette of the I3E says that's a matter of conjecture, no one can say if STEM shortages will exist by the time today's students leave university. This alarm and then boom and then bust cycle that's been described by Harvard's Michael Tiedelbaum is an established economic pattern. Students who graduate during a bust are shocked to discover they can't find jobs or they can find jobs but not stable ones, which happened in computer science after the dot-com bubble burst in 2001. Why not educate students for whatever world they encounter after graduation? Everyone's children deserve a well-rounded curriculum, one that invites them to connect knowledge across subject areas, discover meaning, uncover implications, take initiative, and exercise their imaginations. No parent dreams their child will grow up to become a cog in a digital economy who perform the grunt work of tech support until their jobs are outsourced or, automate or automated. There truly is nothing new under the sun. In 1854, Charles Dickens gave us Thomas Gradgrind, the school teacher who declared, teach these boys and girls nothing but facts, plant nothing else, and root out everything else. Dickens' hard times is a satire of a 19th century philosophy called utilitarianism, and in education it manifested as a belief that working class children need to know only enough to work in factories. In the U.S., principles of utilitarianism are writ large in the Common Core state standards, where Grand Grind's facts rule. To achieve career readiness in my country, students must read 70% nonfiction and only 30% literature. So for us, it's goodbye Dickens and hello Edie Hirsch. Fiction is non-essential, impractical, frivolous even. But fiction is rooted in real life. Dickens wrote Hard Times in the context of the, the British Poor Law of 1834, workhouses, conditions in factories, and that educational philosophy du jour, which he described as seeing figures and averages and nothing else. My students read about 40 books a year. Most of these are novels. When I asked a class of 13-year-olds, do you ever learn anything from fiction? They described insights about Greek and Roman mythology, autism, climate change, the firebombing of Dresden, and the siege of Leningrad, cloning, world religions, leukemia, censorship, steroid abuse, artificial intelligence, evangelical missionaries, the Trujillo regime, the French Revolution, and life for girls in Iran and Afghanistan. Because fiction stirs their feelings, comprehension is assured, memories are created, their frames of reference and their vocabularies expand, and they just get foxier. The novelist Colin McCann put it this way. Got 30 seconds, for, Nancy. For all its imagined moments, literature works in unimaginable ways. As an educator, I appreciate math and science are essential. At my school, methods for teaching them are robust, complex, heads-on, hands-on. But as a humanist, I appreciate democracy. It can't flourish without the humanities, without citizens who understand the past, question the present, make observations, form opinions, and matter the means to express them. The things the fox knows you wind up now, please. how to be interested, interesting, and fully alive on the planet are too valuable to turn our schools into habitats for hedgehogs. I urge you to support the motion. And to, finally, to speak in favour of the motion, I'm pleased to welcome Oli Dibawada, who is the Executive Secretary of the Association for the Development of Education in Africa. Oli, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, before we start, I would want to ask how many of you have cell phones, iPads, laptops, and how many of you can tell me how you got to Dubai? 
raise of hands, I, phones. You too? Okay. <laughs> iPads, laptops. How did you get here? Uh, travel, mode of travel. Okay, all right. Um, and I'm thinking, we're talking about 21st century skills. We're talking about employment. And I'll give you the African perspective. Africa is supposedly to be rising. We're supposed to be going places. Yet we don't, STEM or STEAM is one of our biggest challenges in the continent. Africa is the richest continent in the world and yet the poorest people. All the natural resources we have, we cannot utilize. China moves in, extract the industries, go out, manufacture something, sells it back to us. So how can we be talking about making too much emphasis on STEM when we, the DAC continent, wants to rise without access to science, technology, innovation, education, mathematics? The most remotest, and I mean literally remotest, area, rural area in Africa, every single person has a cell phone. The most illiterate people know how to send SMS, take photographs. In the absence of STEM, how do we expect or intend to move forward? I failed in physics. I failed in mathematics. I loathed mathematics, perhaps because of my teacher. I don't know. But I grew up. I realized that as we speak to children, we speak to the youth, the biggest challenge we have is unemployment. I have met in Nigeria a cab driver who has a PhD but can't find a job. So what I'm trying to get at here is that yes, I totally agree that it is important to have the art, but we cannot move into the 21st century without STEM. It is practically impossible. Our biggest challenge right now is finding teachers and students and youths going into STEM because it has already been branded as a very difficult subject. So no one wants to dare to it. We don't have teachers that can teach. We don't have tools in our continent. Of course, there has to be a lot of emphasis. How do we intend to move forward with technology? The youth don't even know how to think without or to act without using iPhones, iPad, that's how they communicate. So if we don't make too much emphasis, what happens to the next generation coming forward? We are moving and life is about evolution. I totally agree about the fact that we have to put a lot of emphasis on arts and humanities, but I think we need to nurture that at an early stage and you grow with it. But in this day and age, in this present generation, I think we need to emphasize, to focus. My continent cannot move forward without, without STEM. It is, it is impossible. And it's not just the African continent. If you look at examples of growing industries or growing economies, the Chinas, the Koreas, uh, South Korea, uh, the United States, they would not have evolved without the use of STEM. I agree and I emphasize I am an art student. I had my master's in the humanities. My daughter, when I asked her to come into international development and go into the art, and she was like, mommy, I need skills. I need a job. I'm going to neurobiology. I'm going to look at what we can do with drugs. That's where the money is. And she wouldn't, and that's my only daughter. And I was like, she's gonna be a machine. She's gonna be a robot. How do I do that? Well, she's excited. And she is now, I mean, when I'm ill, <laughs> she's the one who said, I think you should do this. I think you should try that. We have issues on health in our continent. We don't have enough doctors. We don't have enough engineers. We are extracting, we are, we are um, exporting, importing. To, to what extent, when do we, and I'm speaking from where I come from, when will we engage in this if we don't start breeding a young generation to go in that? My parents, um, my grandparents didn't go to school. My parents did. But if, if we don't start breeding more youth to get skills in the sciences, in science, in technology, in engineering, in mathematics, 
We had an Ebola crisis in Africa. We had to get doctors and nurses from outside. We couldn't get anyone in the continent. We have, we have health issues. We have energy. We have dams in Ghana, the Akusombo Dam. Ghana is one of the countries that has least electricity because we don't have engineers. So when are we going to start looking at focusing and breeding a new generation of scientists, of mathematicians, of um, doctors? How is that going to happen? I don't want us to be the dark continent. If we are supposed to be the global breadbasket in the next decade, I think we need to have proper instruments. I can't see our farmers using hoe all the time for hectares of land. We need to have technology. We need to have a lot of these things. So um, I, I, while I do agree, I think there is a need for us to evolve. And that's what humanity, that's what life is about, evolution. If we're talking about 21st century skills, we need to get our teachers more engaged in the sciences. We need to get our youth in there. My mom has a phone, and she's been sending me um, WhatsApp and jokes and, and I was like, Mom, what's going on? And she's like, you brought me into technology, so I'm, you know, I'm in touch with the rest of the world. And she had everything she did, she still has address dollars. books where she's writing telephone numbers, and she still keeps it. But now she has evolved, and I am excited for her. I'm excited for my kids. And I urge you that we do not kill this momentum, we do not kill this particular em energy that is going on in the sciences, who knows, we may be living in Mars in 10 years' time. Without STEM, we wouldn't get there. We wouldn't know whether it's good enough for us to live there. Music, yes. Wrapping Arts, up now, please. yes. But STEM, it is, and STEM, we are moving on. Thank you. Thank you to both teams for some excellent arguments. I um, must admit, though, I'm slightly confused. Maybe your speaker is... Um, is a little slow today. It was a long night last night. Um, I don't think the motion is about whether we value the arts or we value the sciences. The motion is about whether we are currently more or too focused on STEM. So in the, in over the next, uh, uh, over the next uh, 15 minutes, we're going to explore the motion further from the floor. And I want to start perhaps coming back to something you said Anna, early on, which is arts are at the bottom of the pile. Well, it's a well-known truth that um, in the United Kingdom, the best way to become prime minister is to do PP, uh, PPE at Oxford. It appears to be the only way to become prime minister these days. Um, President Obama, not a scientist. Most of the civil services globally, not scientists. Is there an element of um, defensiveness on the side of the liberal arts? That, uh, that actually what has been an unduly pro prominent position in our educational thinking for many, many years is now coming more into balance. So, thank you. Um, on the one hand, yes, there's an element of defensiveness <laughs> when what has come into focus, which is in great need, and which I actually am not arguing that we are not in need of STEM. However, it is a fact, it is not contested, that arts education is very limited, it's often poor quality, it's not supported financially in the same way, and yet I believe in what I was trying to speak to, was that a more integrated approach that values not just STEM, but other both hum uh, subjects in, within humanities and the soft skills that we need to create actually are a betterment for students, even the ones that we need to um, access for their for their desire to go into STEM, and I think we should, uh, we should encourage the math, the sciences. But the fact of the matter is, the arts, the humanities, they are um, politically and in sort of our cultures, they are being attacked, and they are 
being underfunded and they are being pushed aside within education systems both through the way that we ask teachers to teach and through actual curriculum in the way that we're supporting it and the way that we policy is implementing curriculum. Is that? That's fine. And for uh, those who oppose the motion, uh, a question from the chair. Um, mathematics is always going to matter in schools. It always has. Um, it's the extension to STEM that is often in dispute. Does the labor market not suggest that teaching technology cycles that may be but, uh, redundant by the time that uh, uh, the children who are learning them reach, uh, reach their jobs, and one might suggest that coding could be in this box, um, is a, grace, a grave disservice to our children? I will argue this. I come from a community with 40% unemployment, 79% poverty, the highest rates of incarceration, HIV, diabetes, adult diabetes, juvenile diabetes, juvenile obesity, adult illiteracy in the United States. 10% of my students only have one parent with a high school diploma. Four out of 10 of my students will be incarcerated by the time they are 21. And there is a 32% graduation rate in my community. So STEM to employment is critical for marginalized communities. Now, Einstein says there are only two things in this world, energy and matter. That's true. Everything else is DNA. And I believe that we, through the promise of STEM, we allow us to unlock our genetic potential, to embrace our inner DNA so that all of us can reach our God-given potential. And as my colleague said, whom both of them I adore, in deference to the arts, I sing. I sing a song, and I sing a song of STEM. And that song, song is simply this, to dream the impossible dream, to fight the unbeatable foe, to bear with unbearable sorry, to run where the brave do not go. That is the song of STEM in the 21st century. And if we pigeonhole it into thinking it's just a bunch of nerds locked behind the computer, shame on all of us. For me, we need more schools and less jails, more books and less guns, more opportunity and less greed, more learning and less vice, more justice and less revenge. We want more, more opportunities to embrace our better nature. And nature itself is rooted in the art of STEM. And when we teach children about nature, we teach them, as my dear colleagues argue, to embrace nurture. And when we teach children to nurture, we as a society collectively embrace our better nature. I say in the South Bronx that 35,000 pounds of vegetables later, my favorite crop is organically grown citizens, graduates, members of the middle class, kids who are eating themselves to good health and inventing new economies in places they've never had it. Kids who are aspiring to careers and destinies and opportunities that they've never imagined in line with better opportunities for themselves and respect for the very planet we live on. That is STEM. We must argue for more STEM. Thank you. Which counterintuitively, of course, would be against the motion. Uh, very good, but you didn't actually answer my question. <laughs> I was trained well in the media briefing, but continue. Um, I, I, the, the critical question is, if we are teaching things other than mathematics by, via STEM, we are making some calls about future job needs that needs must be speculative. Is that not damaging? Well, I think we're educated. Well, it's, for me, I can only speak for myself. It's not just about mathematics, nor is it just about coding. It is a mindset. It is a mindset to embrace opportunities. And I think we are preparing children for a future that none of, in this, none of us in this room have an accurate read on one generation removed. So it is the knowledge of collaboration and coalition and embracing the need to be passionate about the beauty of science, the beauty of math, the actual natural order and rhythm and non-disputable explicit facts of the world in which we live, that is STEM. Thank you very much. I'm gonna ask, uh, in the interest of uh, balance, I'm gonna ask Nancy to respond. Well, as in any society, we need to follow the money. Um, in the United States, President Obama recently requested $4 billion for computer science. And if that means access to coding for everybody who wants it, or an elective, or an enrichment program, 
I'm all for it for those kids who are interested. But if it means coding K to 12, I'm opposed. Then it turns our public schools into nothing else than vocational education, with the private sector driving the public school curriculum. While in my country, we still lack universal preschool education, enough school nurses, enough teachers, crayons, books, safe classrooms, and resources that are basic to acquiring literacy and numeracy. So this is your opportunity, colleagues. I have a hand here and a hand there and there. I'll take three a, a turn. There should be some microphones coming. Hello, could we have some microphones? I can use a confident teacher voice. Oh, yeah, roll out that, <laughs> roll out that confident teacher voice. In fact, why don't you come, in the interest of, uh, so why don't you come to the, uh, uh, to the dispatch box? My name is Mark Reed. I'm from uh, British Columbia, Canada. I noticed a couple of ironies in the argument here um, that are interesting to me. It sounds very persuasive. Where did you learn that persuasive skill? <laughs> I'd ask that question. I'd also identify that there's something that to me is in conflict when governments around the world develop curriculum they spend a ton of money on curriculum for every area. They develop a, a balanced and a comprehensive curriculum for children, and then they don't follow that through with the appropriate funding and support for it to be there. So there, there either has to be the, the, uh, the direction towards balance, STEM, including the, or, or in addition to the arts, or equal to the arts, equal to humanities, equal to other areas of study. You know, the interesting thing to me is um, at certain times in our world, certain things are more important and at other times they're not. No one shows up with protest math. <laughs> Nobody shows up with an equation to change the world. They show up with voice. They show up with the power of speech and thought and literary skill. You know, in British Columbia, our provincial government... <laughs> in British Columbia, our government established a program to double the opportunity. It was called to get more students into computer science and universities. And I happened to be on the Senate Committee for Appeals for registration and transfer at the time. And what I found interesting was that students would apply in through the double the opportunity oper uh, program and within one year, they had moved over to humanities or an arts program. They took any opportunity they could do to get themselves in the door. So I would be very careful about focusing too much on STEM because it may inadvertently open a door for people to abuse that, uh, th that access point or that profile to then go out and do other good things like change the world through voice and arts. Thank you, Mark. We now do have some, uh, some microphones. I would like to hear from someone who will speak, for, uh, speak against the motion. Who would um, we'll come one and then two, and then we'll come back. Sir. Hi, um, I'm Mohamed Kante, and I'm a nerd. Uh, the fact that uh, we've all mentioned oh, math not being useful, um, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a victim of that, right? I went as an electrical engineer by trade. I've learned all the math that I'm not using today. So I am speaking against the motion, or for the, well, no, well, against the motion, right? Because uh, the fact that I know it trains the part of the brain that induce innovation, that resilience that you need for you to create the next cure for a disease like Ebola, right? That part of the brain, even though, yes, you're saying that, oh, that math, nobody shows up at a rally with math equations, those math equations that creates that resilience that's required for any change required to, to do. And they've also spoken, they also mentioned the fact that in the future, everybody raised their hand that technology is being used right now and it will be used. Whether or not you decide to use it, I mean, I guess that's completely up to you. But there is a requirement for the people to develop the apps for those technologies. I think FDR said it best. We cannot always create a future for our kids, but we can create our kids for the future. So with that said, you can decide to go against them, but I guess the future would be against you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, always good to finish on an FDR quote. And we'll come to the lady here. Thank you. My name is Jennifer Kamuli, and I'm a fellow British Columbian as well. 
uh, nice to from you. Um, it seems to me that the, the, it's really an easy thing to solve here because this is just an issue with one letter of the alphabet, and that letter is the first letter of the alphabet, which is A. And in fact, um, it doesn't need to be STEM versus arts or vice versa. In fact, it should be both. And the, um, the A has been misunderstood by most people. Many people have interpreted arts as being creating a poster project or coloring something in or doing something that's uh, cute and artistic in a very limited artistic uh, un understood way. When in fact, Georgette Yakman, who is the founding researcher and developer of STEAM education from Virginia Tech University in the United States, uh, the A actually represents the liberal arts. A is the humanities. The A is the history and the ge geography and the anthropology and all of those components in there. Unfortunately, most people have taken the liberty of interpreting that A to mean we're going to color something in, we're going to do a nice display that goes with this, when it means something quite entirely different. And in fact, her uh, platform and framework for STEAM education solves both of those problems and brings them together in a very nice way. Thank you very much. Anna. And I'll take one more comment from the floor, preferably in, uh, for those who are moving the motion. Gentleman here. Hello, my name, <coughs> excuse me, my name is Jim Delisle from the US and I teach highly gifted high school students who go directly from middle school to college. So they have a college degree by the time they're 17 years old. If they say when they're 14, when they start taking college classes, that they want to be a teacher or they want to be an artist of some type, so many of my students are told, what a waste, because with your brain you should be a scientist. So this is neither for or against the motion, but more of a question of how do we make it not a pressure for students to become something that they don't want to be. Uh, I tell my students, you can be good at something you don't want to do because they could become something because they're so smart, but at the same time, they live in what I call a fur-lined rut. It's very comfortable with a lot of the accommodations that you want to make you comfortable, but you hate getting up and working every day. So I'd like to know that part, the passion that our students have when they're told they're too smart to be a teacher or an artist. I'm going to have to close comments from the floor then and move on to the, uh, uh, to the summing up from the two teams. So Nancy, I'd like you to once again move the motion. Um, I wish to restate the motion to begin. This House believes that we are too focused on STEM education. And in the West, at least, we're in a state of massive overkill. None of us here has dismissed that mathematical knowledge and scientific knowledge is essential. What we're arguing is that there needs to be a balance, and right now, the balance is out of kilter. I think everybody knows the story of Mark Zuckerberg. At Harvard, he majored in um, the Greek, ancient, speaking ancient Greek, psychology, and philosophy. He was not a computer science major. But when his dorm mates were trying to create an app called Face Smash, which rated the hottest girls on campus, he took it over and it became Facebook because his insights from sociology and psychology told him that people would be interested in presenting themselves, images of themselves, on the internet. STEAM isn't sufficient. If STEAM is an equation, and you can use your math skills to figure it out, um, arts are only a fifth of that curriculum. As Vika Poda, who is chief executive of the Varkey Foundation, has put it, we need STEM literate humanities graduates, and we need humanities literate STEM graduates. We need well-rounded citizens to make the future for our children and our grandchildren. Again, I urge you to support the motion. Thank you. And one more time to oppose the uh, motion, I'll ask Ollie to take the floor. I, I couldn't agree more to the closing remarks. I think we need both. But I, also need, I think we also need to respond to the 
existing realities of what is going on. We have been working on art, and I also agree that art is not just about drawing. I wasn't referring to that. I was re referring to values, to cognitive skills, to, to all of that which is important for our growth. In response to that question, I got my persuasion, persuasion skills, biology, thinking, neurobiology, reacting, responding to what feels right inside, both two sides of the same coin. But I, I feel that life is about evolution, and I'm going back to that. If we need to move forward, we need to take on both, but the, the needs that we have right now also focuses on the sciences. We need vehicles, we need, um, you know, we need healthcare, we need, all of those are linked. Without, without STEM, we can't, get, we can't get health services, we can't get doctors, we can't get medical facilities. Without health, without STEM, we can't get electricity, we can't get all of that. I think there needs to be a balance, but we also need to respond to demand versus supply. We need to respond to the existing emerging issues, which is focusing on technology, innovation, uh, sciences of all nature, and, and see how we balance that. So I'm not saying that art isn't. It's what makes us human, is what, why we are here. But over the years, since Stone Age, since human civilization, there has been an evolution. And we need to start getting out of our comfort zones and being brave enough to dare. I think the divine intervention out there created us to explode, to emerge, to, to do things, to go where no one dares go. And we can't do that, that curiosity. If we're curious in thinking in the art, we would also need to do something, use the art, use the mind, use the initiative to be able to move forward and invent something. So STEM is important because it's an evolving and growing. In 30 25, seconds. 30 years time, we may be talking about something else, but it would be complementarity. They're already showing cars and airplanes that are in the air and you're not needing to use any of those. Now we can either choose to deny and not use them or we can choose to use them. Either way, it's gonna come, it's gonna happen. So what do we do under the circumstances? So I urge you that we cannot define nature, we cannot defy the I'm realities up, of please. what is happening. Thank you. So please go against the motion. STEM needs to stay and STEM needs to evolve and we need to have more STEM. Thank you. Thank you, Colleagues, we sit here in a replica of the House of Commons in London. Um, it's fashionable to say that the United Kingdom doesn't have a constitution. It does have a constitution. The constitution is this. What the Queen moves in Parliament is law. So what is decided in our, in our uh, replica here now makes all of the difference. And of course, because of that, the House is designed to em emphasise division. As you can see, you look at each other and not in, a, uh, not in a semicircle, to emphasize the points of difference between the parties. What we've heard today is a number of points of agreement, and there is scope for a bipartisan approach here, but not in my chamber, and not right now. <laughs> <laughs> the motion is this House believes we are too focused now on STEM, that is science, technology, engineering, and maths, education. This was the result of the vote beforehand. As you can see, by 57 to 43, the motion was carried. We will now move to a second vote to measure the progress of these students. So we will begin voting a second, the same as before, one to agree, two to disagree, and we will begin voting now. Well, in the interest of bipartisanship, I'll uh, congratulate Anna and Nancy on being on the winning side, and I will congratulate Stephen and Ollie on moving the House in their favour. There are clearly subcommittees to follow to reach an agreement 
in due course. The debate is closed. The House is brought to order. Thank you very much for your time.